Welcome in, everybody, to Fantasy Pros. This is the Fantasy Football Podcast. It is me, Joey P. Joe P. Zapia. That, of course, is Mike Taglier, and that is Kyle Yates, and it's you. And we're talking all things football, as always, on Fantasy Pros. I want to remind everybody, you can also watch the podcast on our YouTube channel, Fantasy Pros. Subscribe today, click that notifications button. We've got incredible content already backlogged for you to get you caught up. I know a lot of people are starting to get that itch for fantasy football. I get a lot of messages. People are starting to dive deep into some of the pods we've already done. And to let everybody know in the month of July, we're going to be going back to three shows a week, a little bit longer in terms of the length of the shows, deeper dives for everybody. And of course, in August, we'll ramp things up again. So uh, tags, I know today, you know, we're doing a show that you know, maybe some hot take kind of conversations or some themes that are going out there. But when it comes to fantasy fact or fiction, whenever you're out there on the interwebs searching for information, you see a lot of these things flying around. Do you find them provocative or do you find them annoying when you find everybody just throwing out certain things about fantasy football? What's going to happen this year in 21? It's annoying. Um, I, I feel like the media has changed the way that people consume content and, and, and it really drives me bananas because I'm, I'm the guy that doesn't have a whole lot of hot takes. I'm the guy that I want to talk about things. I want to talk them through. I want to talk about the positives and the negatives, but for whatever reason, they put people on TV that just throw a bunch of crap at the wall and you know, they could throw a hundred things of a hundred, hundred pieces of crap at the wall. And if one thing sticks, they're going to stick to that. And they're going to keep bringing it up over and over and over and over again. Uh, whereas we don't do that. We don't, we don't do that. We talk to you guys about, uh, all different scenarios, break, break down the pros and the cons. And if the pros outweigh the cons, then we can lean that way. It doesn't mean that we should be concrete because in fantasy football and in, in sports in general, there are no concrete facts. It's all, it's based on what we take in and you know, how we interpret it. Right, good information. And actually, it's funny. Let's talk to a real verified member of the media. Oh, stop Mr. it. Mr. Yates. <laughs> Yates, how do you feel about that same sort of thing? Because, look, you're, you're part of that, you know, a little bit younger generation of these things where that is more prevalent, I should say, where people like to throw out these big things. And sometimes they can back them up with stats, but sometimes they can't. I kind of lean with tags. Like, I like to bring in information and then give people good advice based on the good information. I think more often than not, if we could do that, we're being successful. But, you know, sometimes there's stuff that flies out there that really feels like maybe a little too melodramatic for my taste. Would you agree? Yeah, well, I think going through Twitter or going through whatever media source, TV, whatever, you can see, you can identify the people who have a process, who have the, you know, the, the process that they can go through to get to that statement that they're going to make or that fact. And maybe they stretch it just a little bit to make it a little bit more attention grabbing or stuff like that, but they have that process. And then you can identify the people that they have no process whatsoever. And they are just throwing stuff at the wall, like Tags said. So I'm excited for this show. This is one that like Tags and I don't know what you're going to bring up at all. So I'm excited for this one to be able to kind of sit down and let's bring some truth to the people. Let's sit down and let's talk this through. Uh, and I'm sure Tags and I are going to disagree, which is always fun. Always <laughs> fun. And look, it's it's a little fantasy or fiction. And, and I'm going to throw 10 things here at the boys that I've come up with that I've I've seen out there floating around, some of which deserves good discussion some of which maybe will blow up and disintegrate into a million pieces we shall see and don't forget at the end we're also gonna go back in history for a little on this day which i know everybody loves and go back in the wayback machine before we do i want to also remind everybody don't forget to join our discord chat at fantasypros.com chat again it's free to join we're gonna do a ton of great content there and remember boys and girls we've also got just a few days left for that stefan diggs autographed jersey it can be yours thanks to our friends at pristine auction go right now to fantasypros.com slash contest all you have to do is drop a review on apple Podcasts or Castbox. screenshot that bad boy go to fantasypros.com slash contest upload it fill out the form you might win a stefan diggs autographed jersey for free just for listening to the show and hanging out here with your boys and of course you are then entered to every other contest after that as well so let's get on it let's start here with number one and let's see if this is indeed fantasy fact or fiction how this is going to work and i was going to make the statement and it's going to be a statement and we're going to go to the guys and see if they think it's fact or fiction maybe a little bit of both maybe neither i don't know that's why we're doing the show that's the whole reason why we're here so let's start here number one early drafting of packers on a discount will be league winners because aaron Rodgers is going nowhere fact or fiction tags let's start with you uh, fiction. And I'm saying fiction because 
Aaron Rodgers is where he's being drafted is around QB six, QB seven. Uh, you're not even giving him a discount. Like if you were getting Rodgers as like the QB 12 or 13. Yeah, I, I'd say that was fair. Devonte Adams is not falling in drafts right now. Aaron Jones is falling to around the RB nine, RB 10 range. That's not far enough of a drop to be a league winner. Um, you're drafting him as an RB one. So this is definitely fiction. You need those players to fall a lot further for in order for them to be league winners at the discount you're getting. Now, I understand the certain ADPs out there, but Yates, I've also been in some best ball drafts, and I know you have too, where you see the Packers go a little bit further than what we've seen in some of the traditional ADP, which by the way, of course, you could see on fantasypros.com. So Yates, what's your thoughts on this? Do Packer discounts early on in these early drafts possibly return a good investment? Well, it's tough because you're literally only looking at two players. It's Devontae Adams and it's Aaron Jones, because outside of that, everyone else has a depressed ADP where it's not anything worth talking about. So with Adams, I mean, he's still the wide receiver one in my rankings. I think that he's the consensus wide receiver one across the board. You might see occasional drafts here or there where he goes as the wide receiver two. Maybe he falls to the wide receiver three, but I don't think that it's enough of a discount where that's taking being taken into account where Aaron Rodgers, you know, I think that it's something where until we see it happen until we see like training camp that Aaron Rodgers is not there or preseason rolls around and Aaron Rodgers still isn't there. Then that's, I think where we start to see that discount come into play. As of right now, I still think it's a little bit too early for Aaron Jones, for Devonte Adams, for that discount to come into play. So I will say fiction here as well. I don't think that it's playing a, a big enough part yet. I do think that, the further that we go into the preseason and the offseason, I think that we could see it play, play so a role, though. Here's here's something I need to tell you guys. So there was a report um, just the other day from, I think it was Pro Football Talk, and it was about Aaron Rodgers has the ability. So if the Packers right. are holding their stance and they're saying, right. hey, we're not dealing you, dude. Like, seriously, we, they flew out to him. They talked to him. And if they said, hey, we're not moving you, this is on, this is on you. Rodgers has until July 2nd, he can actually opt out of the season and keep all this money. It's like over $13 million. And then there's another thing of a, of a, a bonus that he had that could be like $18 million that he might be able to salvage just because he opts out for the season because they're giving that with the Players Association. So I think we might find out sooner rather than later <laughs> what's going on with Aaron Rodgers. Because if he really says, I'm not playing for the Packers. And by the way, Aaron Rodgers is a guy who's held grudges. Uh, he's held grudges against family members. And mm -hmm. if he if he's going to hold a grudge against them, I have, he's going to have no problem doing it against the Packers. So if he... If they're refusing, like legit telling him, we refuse to trade you, he might just say, I'm going to hold out. I'm not going to play. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to ask this question again on July 3rd, and we'll see what the answer is then. <laughs> there you go. Uh, let's go with number two here. The 49ers backfield is too crowded for anyone to emerge as a true fantasy asset. Yates, is that fantasy fact or fantasy fiction? I think it's fiction. I think that we could see this backfield clear up pretty quickly. I mean, we've already got some clarity with Jeff Wilson out okay. for the you know first eight weeks of the season or whatever it is and then Raheem Mostert I think that we're starting to see that Kyle Shanahan you know just can't trust can't he can't lean on Mostert the way that he wants to right because of his durability issues so I think I've said this I think Mostert it's a very good possibility that Mostert isn't even on this roster to start the season so I think maybe the Jeff Wilson injury kind of clears that up where they hang on to him but I think you're going to see Trey Sermon take over this backfield here pretty soon. And Elijah Mitchell, they drafted in the sixth round. I think he's a capable runner himself, an excellent receiver out of the backfield too. So I think we could see this kind of clear up here pretty quickly where we get some clarity on uh, Trey Sermon, I think, as being that lead running back here sooner rather than later. Now, I know we're all three of us are very high on Trey Sermon, but we're also kind of forgetting they brought in Wayne Gallman into this mm -hmm. mix. Right, right. That's, that. right. that's my right. problem. So, Tags, this is where I struggle because that's the exact kind of dude that I feel like can hold back Trey Sermon for a good six to eight weeks here in this if, if Mostert isn't let go or is regardless. So there are a lot of bodies. It isn't even with Jeffrey Wilson Jr. on the shelf. There's still a lot of dudes out there. So what do you think? Is this fantasy fact or fiction that the 49ers are going to give us a fantasy running back worthy of our selection? I mean, you're saying, the, the, so the question wasn't that, though. It's, I was saying fiction in that there can Is be... Is it too crowded for anyone to emerge as a really good fantasy that's option? That's fiction. That's fiction, because th there can yeah. be. Now, if the question was, nobody from this backfield can emerge as a top five running back, I'd say that's a fact. Well, can um, anyone emerge as an RB1? 
it's going to be tough I don't for think them. so. I think it's going to be really tough for them to do that. But an RB2, absolutely. A strong RB2, yeah. Um, but because you think about it in the ways that this offense has been run to this point. And bringing in Wayne Gallman may have been like a Jeff Wilson insurance. They may, be, they may have known about Jeff Wilson's right, injury right, at that right. point. So Wayne Gallman is a competent runner. Elijah Mitchell, I'm not so worried about him. But Trey Sermon, they traded up in the third round. It's not like, hey, we're going to wait around and running backs, we know how important they are to our system. They clearly identified something in Trey Sermon that they said, we love this kid. We want him on our team. We're going to trade up. And, and and it means that much more because this team has no future picks. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They traded everything they had for Trey Lance. They know what they wanted to do with this offense. They have a clear plan in place. It also helps that the 49ers, I do a new strength of schedule, which I do it different than everybody else. And if you guys want to check out those articles, they're on fantasypros.com. But basically, the 49ers came out with the easiest schedule in the NFL for running backs. So there's plenty of opportunity here. This team ran the ball over 400 times, I think, each of the last two years. So there's room for multiple running backs in this offense. The question is, again, he's not going to just go away from Raheem Mostert. He's not just going to go away from another running back like a Wayne Gallman uh, in this backfield to just share that workload. It's just what Kyle Shanahan has done throughout his career. He did it in Atlanta, even with Devonta Freeman and Tevin Coleman. But it's not to say that one can't be a very sturdy running back. Uh, and I think that Trey Sermon or Raheem Mostert, it's one of those two. Uh, but the fact that they traded up for Sermon, it just says a lot considering the, the lack of, of future draft picks that they have with the team. Well, here's a follow-up for you guys. Um, we talked about this on yesterday's show. With you have a guy like Jalen Hurts who's running around a mobile quarterback that sometimes usually opens things up there for the guys in the backfield because uh, you have to have the QB spy out there on the defensive side plus the defensive line gets a little tired from chasing the mobile <laughs> quarterback all around the field. Here's a question for you. If and when Trey Lance comes around here, is this a win here for the San Francisco running backs or a loss because of the style of the Shanahan offense? Whoever wants to pop in, no, go ahead. Yates, Yates, I'm curious what you think here because I would say, yes, it is going to hurt the running backs because the running backs in the system has have always averaged a higher yards per carry. It's not like, oh, now they're getting a mobile quarterback. It's going to increase their yards per carry. These guys are already averaging over five yards per carry almost seemingly every year. Uh, so I don't think it's going to increase it that much, but they're going to lose some goal line work. They're going to lose some of that rushing work to Trey Lance because Lance is the type of quarterback you give him five to eight design runs a game so i think it would actually hurt i think that it kind of washes out in my opinion because i do think that yes trey lance with his mobile you know his mobility his rushing ability i do think that it's going to take away some of the work from trey sermon from raheem Mostert, like just naturally but i do also think that you're going to see more and uh, more and more of a run heavy approach which is crazy from what we've already seen from kyle shanahan i mean there's games where jimmy garoppolo has only thrown the ball 11 times or whatever so I think you're going to see more and more rush attempts, but then also I think the higher yards per carry, because again, the stress that it puts on the defense being having to be able to guard and defend and account for Trey Lance plus the running backs and what they can do in the system. But I do think that this offense with Trey Lance, you guys know that I'm a huge Trey Lance fan. I think that this offense is going to just go nuclear here pretty sooner rather than later. So Mm. I think that the scoring opportunities could even increase there for Trey Lance, but then also, you know, whoever is that main starting running back, especially around the goal line, which I do expect that to be Trey Sermon based on his build. All right, let's go to number three here for Fantasy Factor Fiction. Tags, you love volume. Volume is king. Tags loves the volume. He can't get enough volume. He turns it all the way up to 11 every chance he gets. (laughs) Kyle Pitts is automatically a top four tight end with Julio Jones gone from Atlanta because of the volume. Tags, Fantasy Factor Fiction. Fiction. This is okay. Um, You know, people want to say vacated targets. Vacated targets don't exist. Um, That's about as clear as I can be about it. Uh, When when you that's a good team name, by the way. Vacated targets. I think I might take that on for a league this year. Don't exist. Put a don't exist at the end. uh, In parentheses, (laughs) don't exist. Yeah, no. Um, Because like you lose Julio Jones, you lose one of the best players of all time. Um, That's going to happen. You know, Um, people want to. They're ignoring the fact that Arthur Smith is now the head coach of the Falcons, that it's no longer Dirk Cutter calling the plays. Okay. I, I don't even know do where you need to break. Hold on do a second. You, do you want, do you want, do we need to pause the show? I do need to tag, know. Do tag I me in. Tag no, no, me in no, and then you no. can go. So here's what happens. So I Arthur goodness. Smith ranked 30th and 31st in pass attempts the last two years. He did that while having Ryan Tannehill, who was one of the most efficient quarterbacks in football. Yes, he also de- had Derrick Henry, but they also everybody talks about the Falcons' defense. And they're like, the Falcons' defense is so bad, they're going to be forced to throw the ball a lot. Do we really think that the Titans' defense is good? The Titans' defense is terrible. They're in rebuild mode. They have some young talent at quarterback, at corner. But honestly, on the edge, they've had issues there for a long time. If they're not generating pressure, this team is going to be just as bad as the Falcons. It's, a, it's similar in a lot of ways. Um, so 
you know, Matt Ryan, is he going to be as good a quarterback without Julio Jones? No, he's not. Uh, I, I was looking at that earlier today. His yards per attempt goes down. His yards per game goes down. His touchdowns go down, even though Julio doesn't score. Um, all these things go down. Kyle Pitts is still a rookie tight end. Um, we have to dial back expectations. Kyle Pitts, the part that I hate most about this, you guys, is that Kyle Pitts is a really, really good football player. And no, he's going exactly to be you're and say. he's going to be very, very good in the NFL. But I know what people are going to say after this season. They're going to say, you're the Kyle Pitts hater. I'm not. Kyle Pitts is the best tight end I've ever scouted. However, he is still a rookie tight end, and he's going to an offense that's not going to throw the ball nearly <laughs> as much. There's not vacated targets. If he lives up to tight, uh, to tight end four, awesome. I am so happy for Kyle Pitts. Am I going to bet on it just because Julio Jones is gone? Absolutely not. All right, so uh, that, that's a big fiction in case you still are unsure. <laughs> From Tags. Um, and while we plug Tags back in and reboot him, Yates, what's your take on this here? <laughs> I knew I knew we were going to get a Kyle Pitts question. Uh, well, you have to get a Kyle Pitts question because this, again, I'm, I'm trying to, I went through and I'm, I'm trying to pluck off the things that are really It's on a huge storyline. It, it's yeah. a huge storyline. Tags makes a great point, which I feel like it's going to ruin my enjoyment of Kyle Pitts yeah. even having a good season because even if he has a good season, people might say it's a failure and that's not necessarily fair because of the position historically how hard it is for somebody to return fantasy value on it. But, but here's the thing. If he has a good season, I thought you, you were recharging. him. Hold Go on, back into your on. station. No, no. Go no, back no, into your charging station. If Kyle Pitts Stop has it. a Loud good season, noises. if he has a good season, Kyle Pitts lived up to where you drafted him. Congratulations. Right. Can I it's... Can I talk? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so... I will say this is a really, really tough one. If you had said top five, I probably would have said fact because I've got him right now at tight end four in my rankings. And I want to be clear on something because from a projection standpoint, here's the difference with these top three and why we talk about it. Jamie Eisenberg came on the show and said, you know, uh, what did he say? Great or late, great or you late. know, great or late. Like mm -hmm. the top three, this is why we talk about the top three, because in, from a projection standpoint, I've got Travis Kelsey with 264 points on the season. George Kittle with 223, Darren Waller, 218, Kyle Pitts, 168. So that is the drop off. They're going from 218 projected fantasy points to 168 from tight end three to tight end four. Then all of these guys are right in the same range where I've got Mark Andrews literally right behind him. Robert Tunyon right there, assuming Aaron Rodgers plays. John New Smith, Tyler Hay, all these guys are right there from a projected fantasy right. standpoint. So as a top five option, I probably would have said fact because it's not going to take a ton for him to get there. And there is a ton of volume because... Okay, yes, they're not going to have it. Maybe they're not going to be as pass happy as they were with Dirk Cutter, but Russell Gage is not getting 130 targets. Calvin Ridley's not getting 180 targets. He might. Like, I don't think he is. So, like, <laughs> who know. who else is going to get step up here? It's not Olamide Zacchaeus. It's not Cordero Patterson. It's not Frank Darby. You know, so, like, who else is going to step up here? It's going to be Kyle Pitts who's going to get every opportunity. So, I think that if you had said top five, I would have said fact. But the fact that I've got him at tight end four and you set that threshold at tight end four is so close for me where I can't confidently bet on that. So I will yeah, say fair. fiction because I think that, but I do think that it's a very, very close gap there. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to ask this question in duck. Uh, so uh, <laughs> Darren Waller was pretty good. First shot out of the gate in his debut as a tight end. Why can't Kyle Pitts have that well, same Darren, Darren Waller? Darren Waller was in the NFL Waller, for years. Yeah. I know. I understand he was, but uh, but was he? You a... still you still practice with NFL teams. He was, okay. he was still practicing during that. That's time. why I'm asking the question because well, I think it needs to be asked. I've listened to, to tight asked. ends in the past. Like I've listened to guys like Travis Kelsey, where he's talked about it. He says when I first came into the league, I was I thought I was all that, and he's like, and you, you didn't see me produce right out of the gate like some people would expect you to uh, as a tight end. He's like because there's a lot more than just re the receiving game. You're not going to stay on the field if you can't block. He's like that was the number one thing. Learn right, how but to Darren. Waller as a wide receiver, you can argue the other end, which is it's actually harder for him to transition to tight end and become that guy. And he not only took that on, but again, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate for fun because I want to see tags possibly explode during this episode, oh. but I want to just kind of see, yeah. you know, is that if that's within the realm of possibilities, because if so, then Kyle Pitts is a tight end four. Well, if the Pitts, if they, it, I don't know how Arthur Smith's going to do it. Um, That's fair. If, if they line him up as a wide receiver more than half the time, like legitimately out wide, I'm not talking about in the slot like they do with a lot of different tight ends, but if they line him up as a wide receiver, like legitimately where Yahoo and ESPN and all these different formats, they have to figure out whether or not he loses tight end eligibility like a Marcus Colston. If they start doing that, that's going to change everything. 
because you drafted him as a tight end and they're going to have to leave him there for the year. Um, that would change everything for me. But if they really are going to use him as a tight end and they're going to line him up <laughs> out wide at times, kind of like they do with like a George Kittle or a Travis Kelsey, um, then obviously I'm going to dial back expectations. And here, let me be clear. I'm going to rank Kyle Pitts probably around tight end six uh, going into the season. So I'm not like particularly low on him because again, that volume is, is what's king. And he is going to get some volume because there's Calvin Ridley, outside of Calvin Ridley, there's nobody. And that's why he's going to get that volume. Gage question, had some moments last year where he was okay. Yeah, but he's I, not going to play. Tough. But he's not a perimeter receiver. He's that's not, fair. He's that not is also there. fair. But he, um, but he had some moments and some useful uh, fantasy weeks for sure when yeah. he was put into that role of having to get extra volume. But what it comes down to is, it, really what it comes down to is where you have to draft Kyle Pitts to get him. That's my right. biggest problem right now. Because if you want to draft one of the top three, I get it. But there's a serious gap between those guys and Kyle Pitts or even Mark Andrews. Mark Andrews has proven the build, the ability to do it year in, year out. Snap shares are down. So I, you can make cases for any of these guys, but bottom line, they need to be in a completely different tier. They need to fall into that fifth round range because there's still guaranteed lock wide receivers on the board in the fourth round. Guys that cannot miss. Guys that have top 10 upside that you can draft right there. Whereas Kyle Pitts, do you guys see any scenario where he finishes as a top two tight end? No. And here's the no. here's the really interesting thing, like with talking about the projected fantasy points, like the difference there with Darren Waller from a wide, if he was a wide receiver, he would slot in as my wide receiver 10. OK, so like that from a projected fantasy standpoint, projected points, that's where he would go. Kyle Pitts is the 168 projected fantasy points, wide receiver 31. You know, so like that is the huge, that's the huge gap that we're talking about. So yep. when you have to draft Kyle Pitts there, mm -hmm. that's a different conversation though. Right. What you're asking, what Joe's asking is, does he finish as a top four tight end? I think there's a very realistic chance that he does it. Is it going to be worth where you draft him? No, that's a completely different exactly. scenario right. and situation because you're going to have to spend a fifth round pick on him when, you know, you could get a guy like Corey Davis who I've got at wide receiver 27, you can get him in round eight, round nine or whatever, you know, so that's the, that's the difference there. All right, now this is a very competitive discussion. I like that. And if you like competitive and active leagues and maybe your fantasy league's just not doing it for you, then maybe you feel like the draft is too predictable or it just isn't enough strategy, then you'll want to check out LeagueTycoon.com today. LeagueTycoon.com is the site that's built specifically for contract salary cap leagues. And a lot of people want to upgrade their redraft to a contract salary cap dynasty, but are overwhelmed by all the amount of work required to set it up and run those kind of leagues. But when you create a contract league on LeagueTycoon.com, everything is built in an automated sense for your league. No more spreadsheets, none of that nonsense. Even with no experience, you can have your contract league up and running in just minutes using their optimized default settings. Best of all, League Tycoon makes it easy for new players to understand and manage their teams by providing a top of the line mobile app and website. So head over to LeagueTycoon.com to get started. And trust me, your league mates will definitely thank you. And again, that's LeagueTycoon.com. Let's go and continue on with a little fantasy fact or fiction, and we'll go to the next topic here on our list, which is number five. Actually, no, it's number four, pardon me. The Steelers' offensive line will hold back the upside of Najee Harris. I'm going to start with Yates on this one because I want tags to breathe first. Uh, so, <laughs> Yates, Najee Harris will get held back because this is floating around there a lot. A lot of people love Najee Harris, but like, you know, this offensive line, they, you know, they, they just, you know, let go of somebody else on that offensive line, a veteran. Yep. What do you think here about the Steelers' Do you think this fact or fiction, they are going to hold back Najee Harris's upside because the O-line just, frankly, isn't that great? It depends on how you define upside. Okay. If it is a top five upside, yes, I do think so. I think that, you know, I'll say fact there because I think that this offensive line, losing David DeCastro, bringing in Trey Turner, like DeCastro had some injury concerns. He's contemplating retirement. So I get moving on from him. Trey Turner was still here on the free agent market here in late June. So it doesn't exactly speak to his, you know, uh, the league's confidence in his abilities or whatever. So there is a lot of turnover on this offensive line. Najee Harris, again, volume is king. So he's going to be a very, very safe option week in and week out. I have him right now. I bumped him down because of the DeCastro release. I've got him at RB10. I've got okay. Nick Chubb right above him now by one fantasy point. So I think Najee Harris is a very, very safe option. I still have him within my top 10 running backs, but to get to that top five upside with the offensive line that he's got in front of him, I do think that it's going to hold him back a little bit. Tags, this has been a very chicken and egg conversation, and I imagine we're going to have a lot more of it. And until we see it in preseason, really develop a little bit at least, not that you could take too much out of preseason, but 
it's definitely something for concern as people head into the season. So what do you think? Fact or fiction, the O-line of the Steelers holds back Najee Harris's upside. Well, I, I, I kind of agree with Yates in terms of, like, it depends on how you phrase that. Like, if you say he's not going to finish as a top three running back because of that offensive line, I would agree with you. However, I... I, I I think it's fair to say he's going to get 20 touches per game. Is that fair to say that he's going to get that in this offense? Okay. So I went back and I looked over the last 10 years. The last 10 years, there have been just 36 running backs who have seen 325 plus touches, which is right around 20 touches per game. There are only two of those running backs who finished worse than the RB7 in half half PPR formats. Um, And those two running backs were Leonard Fournette. And that was a year he scored three touchdowns, three total (laughs) touchdowns on 341 touches. Uh, and then there was LaShawn McCoy who finished, he was the, his was the worst finished at RB 12. He scored a total of five touchdowns that year on 344 touches. So to keep Najee Harris outside of the top 10 running backs, you're going to need him to score five or fewer touchdowns, which I don't think anybody's going to anticipate that. I, even though the, even those who don't like Najee Harris, they don't like the Steelers this year. They're going to tell you he's going to score more than five touchdowns. And then even if, Again, they're going to admit that he's going to get a lot of touches. Volume means everything to running backs in today's NFL. You're, you could find running backs in past years. I mean, Christian McCaffrey, for, for Christ's sake. The, the, the Panthers might have the worst offensive line in football, but people are still drafting Christian McCaffrey as the RB1 because he's proven that he overcomes it. He's proven that he gets tons of volume in this offense. It's the same thing with Najee Harris. Uh, if you like Najee Harris in Dynasty, there is absolutely zero reason not to like him in redraft this year. So I, I know that's a long way to go about it, but... So well, it's a good I, analogy you make too with the Panthers and McCaffrey. If everybody loves McCaffrey and they have offensive line issues, then they might have the worst offensive line in football. Here, Panthers, here's a question honest. for you. How many of that stat that you just threw out, how many of those guys with the volume you were talking about mm-hmm. were rookies? That's my curiosity there. I'd have to go back and find that. I have because to go back that's and look something that. that I think we can throw that wrinkle in there too. How, how much are we pushing the envelope with a player of this age and an extra game in the season for the first time too? Well, there's a lot going on right, there in right. terms of management. Possibly. Well, to be to be fair, I do an article. It's actually going to come out in the middle of this month. Uh, it's at what age does a running back decline? And it also you could also ask the question: At what age does a running back peak? Um, and I and the best percentage peak. for running backs is 21 to 23 years old. So basically, it's right when they come into the league, they have the best chance to finish as an RB one. Um, it it doesn't take time for a running back. So um, yeah, I, they can hold him back from top three numbers, even maybe top five, because again, this offense may not score as many points as they used to, but uh, he's still easy a top 10. So basically back. an injury is the only thing keeping him from being an RB one. Bingo. All right, there you go. Number five here on the fantasy fact or fiction list Tua a tongue of Iloa will struggle in his second year and Miami will wish they could turn to Ryan Fitzpatrick tags. You want to take this one first? I feel really bad about this one, and I, I don't know what to expect because Tua was a guy that it was almost like he was a Trevor Lawrence-type prospect for a long time. Uh, tank for Tua. You, you, you guys mm-hmm. remember that? Sure, of course. Um, that, that was a real thing, and then the injury started to pile up. And I remember shooting Yates a text during while I was scouting Tua Tungavailoa, and Yates had just started with Fantasy Pros, pros and I was like, Yates, I don't want to put this out on Twitter because I feel like I'm going to get ridiculed endlessly, but... Am I missing? There, there's some things that Tua Tungavailoa does that I don't like, that he, he's just missing. Uh, Henry Ruggs, there were multiple times where Ruggs was, literally had no one within five yards of him, and Tua just overthrew him. So there were inconsistencies in his play and what I saw, but based on what they've put around him, in ter- you know, getting Will Fuller, adding Jalen Waddell, I don't want to. I don't want to just throw him away because he had a bad rookie year. I mean, it was a weird off season. I think it was remarkable what Justin Herbert did. Uh, Joe Burrow had a terrible season too, by the way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight that in some upcoming articles. Burrow was terrible. Um, it, it could Zach Taylor's offense is pretty terrible in its own right, and I think that we're going to figure that out soon. Uh, That's right, because new head coach next year, Joe Brady, is going to fix all that. <laughs> but Burrow had better weapons than than Tua did last year. You know, Devontae Parker, not a separator. Tua had to figure that out, like, real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, so now he's got some natural separators on his team. So I, I'm not, not going to say he's going to struggle. So I'm going to say this is fiction. All right, so another year removed from the injury, real offseason with the players that he's supposed to be playing with, a lot of new toys. Do you think it's fantasy fact or fiction that Tua struggles in year two, Yates? Fiction. I really, really like Tua this upcoming year. Uh, for every reason that you listed out. I mean, let's not forget that he was still rehabbing from yeah, his right. like almost career-ending injury last year. So, I mean, for everything, we have just become so... I, I don't know what the right Impatient. word is. Impatient. 
impatient. Like we have become <laughs> so impatient with these rookie quarterbacks that have come in. And if they don't produce right away, we just completely write them off. And it's like, let's slow down here for a minute. Cause that is a huge adjustment for Tua to go from the supporting cast that he had at Alabama, Jerry Judy, Henry Ruggs, Jalen Waddle, Devonte Smith, all first round r wide receivers. Like that is ridiculous what he was throwing to. And then he goes to, I mean, who was he throwing to in like week 13 or 14 last year? Lynn Bowden Jr. was like his leading receiver. So let's just, if if he had, if Miami didn't make the significant jumps that they did in bringing in a revamped receiving core, then that would be something where I'd probably lean more fact because I just don't think that he has the, the weapons around him to be able to succeed, to take that jump. But he does have those weapons now. I love Jalen Waddle. I love Will Fuller. I love Devontae Parker as that, Right. Big physical presence, that contested catch receiver. And Tua talked about it. He had to learn how to throw into contested situations because he never had to do that at Alabama. Because <laughs> everybody was everyone open. was freaking <laughs> wide open. So I think all this just goes together for me to say, let's not write off Tua just yet. Let's give him a full season. Let's see what we see. And then we can talk about year three. But I think we're going to see a, a big jump from him in year two. Yeah, I'm with you guys. I, I think it's fiction too. And I think the Tua offensive line is line's a problem. Just want to say that. The offensive line is a problem. And yeah. I, I mean, the Wait, lack why? of a real. Well, it's not great, it's but bad. I think, but I, I think what on top of that is too, when you look at the backfield, I would feel even better if they had a real workhorse running back that I could believe in. And I, and I like miles Gaskin did a really good job last year with the opportunities he was given. I, I'm not going to be negative about him either. I love the way he bounced out runs to the outside sometimes when the holes weren't there, but maybe miles Gaskin is exactly that guy suited for this sort of offensive line because he does have the ability to bounce those runs outside when they're not there. Um, but I, I don't know for me, I think that once again, it was a lot of put on this guy. And the one thing you could take away too, is the confidence that the Dolphins showed in, in him to make that change of quarterback, even though the team was competitive and playing well and, and in a playoff hunt that they were ready to make that turn just into him. So I think if you're Tua, you take that confidence and you build it into next season and you say, yeah, the organization believes in me, so I should believe in me and continue to develop. And yeah, they've definitely surrounded them with some better weapons that certainly should help. All right, let's get to question number six here. Derek Henry, my boy, will be the first running back to ever have back-to-back 2,000-yard -back rushing seasons. Yates, let's start with you. Fact, Fact or fiction? Yeah! Fact. And oh. I'm saying this because he's aided by the 17-game season. That that's, that's going fair. to play a role, right? So I think with last year, it was that, you know, okay, does he get there? Does he get there with the 2,000 yards? And we were having that conversation in week 16, week 17. And now that you have week 18 built into the schedule, I think that that certainly helps. So, I mean, Derrick Henry, the guys, he's getting better. At, and like everyone talks about how it's eventually, his workload's eventually going to catch up to him. I'll pull up the stats in a second, but like, he's getting better as time goes on. Like it is just ridiculous. Now I do think that this offense takes maybe a little bit of a step back. You've got some with going from Arthur Smith to Todd Downing. There's some concern there, but I have very, very little concern with Derrick Henry. I've got him as a top three running back this year. I think he can easily break 2000 yards again. I'm with you, Yates. I think it's a fact too. I think that extra game really helps him kind of push this. And yes, there'll be the asterisks because it's now 17 games, but that's part of the equation here. I can tell already from Tags' face that he is not buying this. So, uh, what do you think about this back-to-back -back 2K for no, Derrick Henry? Yard, 2,000 yards is special. I mean, it's special. Yeah. That's that. There's no other way about it. And he are you saying Derrick Henry's not special? He that's had what three, I heard. Hold on, hold on. That's he what had I heard. 378 carries last year. So, I mean, that's just that's stupid. That's 378 ridiculous. carries. So even even with the extra game, they're going to dial this back. It's not Arthur Smith's offense anymore. Again, things are changing. Julio Jones part of this team. It is going to flip some of that run to pass ratio. The defense getting worse and worse seemingly. It's not going to help the run pass ratio. So there's so many things factoring into this that no, Derrick Henry Again, he just barely hit 2,000 yards last year, and that was while averaging 5.4 yards per carry. It is ridiculously hard to hit 2,000 yards rushing. There was only two running backs that topped like 1,100 yards last year. So, no, I, Derrick Henry can still be special, but that doesn't mean that he needs to hit 2,000 rushing yards to do it. So, no. And by the way, Joe, I looked at it while Yates was talking. Four running, four rookie running backs ah. were part of that list. So, who were they? I'm just curious. What are the names? Are? Uh, they yeah, were so. they the uh, Doug Martin was one of them. Ah. Ezekiel, Doug Martin. Uh, Jeez, Ezekiel, nice. Ezekiel, Ezekiel Elliott was one of them. Right. Saquon Barkley Saquon. Saquon. was one of them. Right. And who was the last one? Kareem Hunt. Ah, yeah, oh. another good one. True. Yeah, and and you know what? The what's so interesting about that is you know how recent <laughs> some of those last ones were that you just said yeah. so there's there's that trend that we always talk about how the nfl you know continues to evolve all right let's get to the next one here fantasy fact or fiction 
Number seven, Carson Wentz will revive and thrive in Indianapolis. Tags, we'll start with you with this one. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll say fact. Um, I, I don't know how far, what that means in terms of like, right. you know, is he finishes a top six quarterback? No. Uh, let's, but, well, let's put it easily. We already know he's not going to finish as a top six quarterback because right. we've set the threshold that to do that, you have to have rushing equity and rushing touchdowns and all the other things. He's not uh-huh. going to do that probably. So now let's talk about QB one. He's in that Brady Stafford, Matt Ryan grouping of guys, right? That lower tier of QB one. I think that would be revive and thrive because two years ago, this was the only quarterback that threw a touchdown pass in every single game as a QB one. No other QB one did that two years ago. Carson Wentz did. Can he get back to being that consistent floor guy? Yeah, prior to last year, I think that uh, the stat I had in the boom bust and everything in between was that Wentz was a, a, a posted QB one type mm-hmm. numbers in at least fifty percent of his games yeah. for three years straight. Only him and Deshaun Watson were the only quarterbacks to do that, uh, and that Frank Reich was a big part of that. So going to Indianapolis with a better offensive line, Wentz is a better quarterback when he's not under pressure, and that offensive line is certainly going to help. So I'll say this is fact: he is going to revive his career and be considered. I think that that, that the Colts got a deal on him. I, I I really do. I think it was a smart move for them as a franchise and uh so i'll say fact i agree with you i think it's fact too yates you want to make it three for three i can't okay uh, i'll say fiction here and it's because of that threshold like do i think it's in the realm of possibilities yes absolutely that he can revive his career that he can take the step forward i think that he's got a very very good chance of doing so but to be a top 12 quarterback that is a massive jump from what we saw out of him just last year right like this guy was benched and we can argue about whether or not he should have been benched but to go from being benched to a top 12 quarterback the next year that is a massive jump so i just can't the percentage chances in my mind are not playing out there for me to to buy into this one so i'll say fiction but i do think that he can come close to it all right we got a few more questions to ask here of the guys and get their answers but before we do i want to recognize another sponsor of today's show and that of course is pristine auction they have daily auctions ending nightly with hundreds of lots tons of sports memorabilia for your man cave or your woman cave always something for the perfect fan of every single team so here's what you do you can go without a pristine auction you can join for free Everything there is authentic. You get the uh, certificate of guaranteed authenticity with everything that you purchase there. It's affordable. Some things are not thousands of dollars. There's things that are hundreds of dollars or even 25 bucks that just look cool. You want it on your desk. You want to hang out with, you know, a cool helmet from your favorite player on your desk to make you smile where you're doing grunt work and putting in all sorts of data and things like that. This is a good thing. Pristine Auctions got it for you. And of course, you know, once again, it's quick and free to register. So, all you got to do is go to pristineauction.com, enter the code FANTASYPROS, that's all one word in the registration field, located at the top of the registration page, and it's free to sign up, and they get $5 credit with that code FANTASYPROS on us. Again, that code is FANTASYPROS, one word, 5 bucks just for signing up. Go use that, throw 20 and there you go. You got 25 bucks in there, and you can bid on something cool. Once again, go to pristineauction.com, that is P-R-I-S-T-I-N-E, auction.com let's get to the next in our fantasy fact or fiction questions we've got three more here so number eight deshaun watson will play in the nfl in 2021 yates fact or fiction who freaking knows um (laughs) i will say again listen to the question i'm gonna i'm gonna phrase it one more time deshaun watson will play in the nfl in 2021 i didn't say where right just play Right. At some point in time. Okay. Oh, uh, still, who freaking knows? Uh, I will say, <laughs> I'll say fact, but okay. I think that he gets a suspension from the league and we don't see him until later on. For what team? No idea. Uh, it, so it I'll say like. fact, but I can't see them sitting Deshaun Watson an entire year. It seems like the commissioner's exempt list is in his future for at least four weeks or something. To, I think that's got to be the minimum, but... Uh, once again, I don't know what his trade value is. I don't know what his value is to the Texans. I don't know if he wants to come back and play for the Texans. There's a lot of questions here. Tags, fact or fiction, Deshaun Watson will play in the NFL this year. Fiction. Really? I don't the think, entire I don't season? You, uh, uh, he doesn't want to play for the Texans and the Texans I was going to say trade why. Him. Because he doesn't. Because he's available to play and doesn't or because he's not available He's going to get suspended. The question is how long. The question is when does this get wrapped up to the point where they can suspend him because they're going to let the legal proceedings take place before anything happens. And that's part of the reason I don't think that he gets traded is that no team wants to trade for him knowing what's up in the air. Because if something were to happen with him, like let's say that he were to go to jail, 
Um, it's a real possibility where if that were to happen and a team traded for him during this process, how bad would they look? So no team's going to trade for him right now. And again, he doesn't want to play for the Texans and they've drafted, they drafted a quarterback. They signed multiple quarterbacks. They traded for quarterbacks. The, the Texans don't know what they're doing, but uh, no, I'm going to say he doesn't play. You can get a carton of cigarettes in that deal too. If you trade for Deshaun Watson, if he's in prison. <laughs> uh, all right. Kyler Murray, number nine. This is the topic for number nine. Kyler Murray will become the first quarterback to throw for 4,000 yards and rush for 1,000 yards in a season. He was on pace last year to do this, but we all know he didn't quite get there. But does that change this year? Tags, Fantasy Factor Fiction, Murray can do it this year. And keep in mind, he does have that extra game to do it. Uh, I'm going to say fact. There are two quarterbacks that do it. Lamar Jackson does it before Kyler Murray. Whoa, I like this one. Yates, what do you think about that? Uh, I can't call Lamar Jackson. Uh, I'm not going to go that far, uh, but I will call Kyler Murray there. I think that he can, I think that he can hit it. Okay. So if he hits this threshold boys, how valuable is he right now in terms of your return on investments in your draft? Because quarterback going somewhere fourth, (laughs) fifth round, typically speaking of most drafts, I would say, is that worth paying up for? Because if we think he can have this kind of season, that is transcendent. That is game changing. That's somebody on a weekly basis gives you a ceiling, that is a, a winning a week for you and a floor that is certainly making you competitive every week. So guys, what do you think about that? Lamar Jackson's better. I'd rather have Lamar Jackson. He's going after him. Okay. That's, that's fair. I don't think that's... Kyler Murray's a bad pick. I just think Lamar Jackson's better. <clears throat> Gates, what are your thoughts here? It, again, it's all the value game. Like, and I'm not going to disagree with tags. I mean, I've got Kyler Murray at QB three with 376 fantasy points. I've got Lamar Jackson at QB four with 371. So like right there, neck and neck. So I think if you can play the value game, if and this is the benefit of being able to have this process where I can look and say, yeah, I've got these guys right next to one another, right? So then, okay, I'll just take the cheaper of the two options and I'll play that value game. So if Lamar Jackson does have this lower ADP, then I'll take Lamar Jackson there. But I think Kyler Murray, if you want to pull the trigger on him as that third quarterback off the board, I'm obviously not going to have any issues with it. I'll ask you this too, because you guys know that having a top five quarterback is something that I find very useful and this is where the nfl is and i'm going to be there with it uh is this something you are not building into your strategies but uh, like you're saying tags you seem to be very confident about lamar jackson mm-hmm. are you somebody's going to put that on your team you're going to take that fourth round lamar jackson value or whatever fifth it ends up fifth, fifth round. round value yeah are you going to be that person who does that in fifth round yeah absolutely i'll, t- I'll take him um yes yes okay same thing with Kyler murray too if jackson's not on the board um, Kyler Murray, I don't, I don't feel as confident about, I think he's fine. Um, I'm not as excited to draft Kyler Murray as I am Lamar Jackson, if that makes sense, just because I have to project a leap for Murray in order to get him where Lamar Jackson is. Whereas Lamar Jackson has proven over the last two years that he's, you, you start him every single week you do, and he can win you a fantasy championship. And now he has the best weapons of his career. So why am I going to downgrade Lamar Jackson? Whereas Kyler Murray, can we say that AJ Green's a downgrade? <laughs> oh goodness i don't want to say that i don't i don't want to say it but i can't say it's not great either i I think what you also factor into is the first half of last year lamar jackson was underwhelming and did certainly did not return the value we're looking for it was only towards the latter part of the season where it started to look like that dude again who won the mvp yates are you someone who's going to look for either of these kind of quarterbacks in the you know first five rounds of a draft i personally probably won't because there are other guys it's just the strategy that i deploy every single year which is late round qb that there are guys that are all in the same kind of range that i can get super super late and just play the streaming quarterback game uh and i like the way that my teams come out when i am drafting a running back or a wide receiver in that fourth or fifth round range so i personally won't but again i'm not going to fight anyone if they want to select a kyler murray or lamar jackson there because i do think that they have the chance to be special all right, we've got one more question, and after this question, we're going to ask it. We're going to go a little in uh, in backwards mode into the past, play a little on this day. But last question here for you guys, fantasy fact or fiction. Drew Brees' retirement marks the end of the Saints' offense as we know it. Now, I know this is kind of you know a little big picture here, but the Saints' offense, in terms of fantasy value, last <laughs> few years with Kamara, with Michael Thomas has been very good. Last year, we know Thomas had the injury, and we know what happened there in Breeze. Last two years, missed significant time in the seasons. But now we're really turning the page here. So, Yates, in your opinion, does Drew Breeze mark the end of the Saints in terms of those big-time fantasy investments we used to get excited about? Well, 
I think that if we're talking about the Saints offense as a whole, returning top, like being a top five offense, I'll say no. But I don't think that it's going to be directly correlated with Drew Brees' retirement. I think it's going to be an overall like context that you, the defense was gutted. They had to, right? Because of the Contracts. salary cap, yeah. like, mm-hmm. and just trying to get underneath the salary cap. And so there's a lot that has gone on with this team that I think is going to play a role in not only just Drew Brees retiring, because let's not pretend that Drew Brees was. Uh, outstanding the last couple of years he was still very very good but he was not the reason that the offense was performing at such a high level so I think that if we do see Jameis Winston step in I think that we're going to see a very very capable offense I think that we can see them return top 15 value uh, as far as an overall offense and then you'll have Michael Thomas you'll have Alvin Kamara they're going to be great for fantasy uh, but I don't think that we can necessarily hold Michael Thomas to this wide receiver one you know kind of just put him on that pedestal that we had for the past couple of years all right, fair enough. Um, Tags, your thoughts here on this one and Breeze being gone here from the Saints and what that really means at the end of the day because we all think that, you know, the fantasy value of guys like Thomas will bounce back. We all think that Kamara's still very good. But how good are they now by comparison without that leader, without that guy who is a Hall of Fame quarterback under center? It's going to certainly change things. And, you know, whether it's Taysom Hill or Jameis Winston, it's it's a different answer. Uh, so, you know, if Taysom Hill's under center, am I going to lower the expectations for a lot of guys? Yeah, absolutely, because he's going to take away a lot of rushing production from Alvin Kamara and Latavius Murray. He's going to take away a lot of pass attempts uh, from this offense in general, like a Tra- Traquan Smith or even Michael Thomas, for example, because he's not going to be able to get to 170, 180 targets that he could with Jameis Winston. The Saints offense is still going to be really good. It's just a matter of who's under center and where the production's coming from. That's what matters. Uh, So Jameis is going to prop up everybody, whereas Taysom Hill is going to steal some of that, and then he's going to lower the ceiling of everybody around him. But the Saints offense is still going to be very good. What do we think is going to be the answer to that question, too? Because do we think it's going to be Winston? I I personally do. I I I don't see an NFL team saying, here you go, Taysom Hill. At this we said the age, same thing. We said the record. same thing middle of last season, and it was the th- the reason that I don't want to dismiss Taysom yeah, but Hill. Mid- is hold on one second, it- one second, Tex, because I just want to throw this out there. I can understand not doing it mid season because Winston was you know still getting acclimated. Hill was comfortable. He had taken a lot of snaps with the ones because he's out there playing snaps with the ones. So I kind of get that. If you thought you could just kind of manage through it and you looked at the schedule and you saw Denver on there and you saw a couple winnable games for yourselves if you're the Saints, I get the managing through it aspect. This is not about managing. This is about planning a season now. So with that in mind, do you think there's any way that they turn the reins to Taysom Hill as a full-time quarterback? But that's the thing. It was such a drastic change to go from Breeze to Taysom Hill. Like, doing that midseason is really tough to do with an offense. And they made it work because Taysom Hill was able to make – They the reason they paid Taysom Hill a crap ton of money is because they like him as a player. Uh, Jameis Winston was sitting out there in free agency for a while. Mm-hmm. He was not a priority on the Saints list. It wasn't like – they said we, they wanted him back, but it, apparently it, they didn't really want him back <laughs> enough to say, hey, we're going to sign you before you hit free agency. Um, I want Jameis to win the job I do and do I think that he should do I think that Sean Payton can make it work with either quarterback I do and I listening to the beat reporters I don't think anyone knows what's happening here I think Mm -hmm. that they're saying it's an open competition and we're open to start either quarterback I'd I'd be tempted to say it's Taysom Hill right now unless Jameis proves him wrong can I I'll tell you what that's the case I'm really worried go ahead super quick I, I think you're to go back to your question about why didn't they turn to Winston I think that Sean Payton has had this you know Uh, he's been enamored with Taysom Hill for however many years now. And I think that he knew that Drew Brees was coming up on the end. So if there was ever a time where you get to figure out if Taysom Hill is the future, that was the time that you do it. You know, it was that you have Jameis Winston waiting there because you know that you can turn to him to be a competent NFL quarterback. Uh, uh, Obviously, if you rein him in, but you didn't know what Taysom Hill was going to be. So that was your opportunity to be able to get that answer. Otherwise, if he hadn't, then we're still having that conversation here in this offseason to go, can Taysom Hill be a competent NFL quarterback? From what I saw from him last year, he can execute an offense, but I don't think that he's going to be something that elevates it. And especially with what the Saints need this year, is they're going to need something more from their offense because their defense took a step backwards. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I think Winston has to be that guy. I just feel like I, look, I, I think you, I think you're, you hit the nail on the head, Yates, which is they gave him the audition because it was a good time to do it because they felt like the schedule allowed it because he was kind of in the rhythm already what was going. But I didn't see anything there where I could walk away going, yep, that's my starter of the future at his age with his injury history too. Let's not forget like he was always perfect in college and getting hurt. I mean, I just, there's a lot to unpack here. Maybe you get a little bit more of that Taysom Hill package working in there at times. But Winston's got to be the quarterback if you're going to be serious about going at this division. And I think they're still serious about that. I don't think Sean Payton likes to lose. All right. 
That'll do it for our fantasy and fiction, so let's play a little game. We've done our work, so now let's have some fun. Let's go back in time to on this day, and let's go back to 2012, June 29th. Actress Katie Holmes divorces uh, Tom Cruise. Obviously, this was uh, this broke the hearts of a lot of people out there. They had differences about their religious beliefs. Uh, you know, she had religious beliefs, and, you know, he's a Scientologist. Uh, but let's move on to the next question here from this, which is, which NFL player are you divorcing in 2021? And Yates, would you like to take a, a special test that I've lined up for you that tells you about the aliens inside your body? Uh, nope. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, that kind of scared me and now I'm rattled. Uh, okay, so I think a player that I'm divorcing in... So it should be a player Here, I think recommended that I can you have, his, have a history go. with, but you're out on now. Go ahead, Tags. You were going to say something. I mean, there, there's two obvious players for me that I can say. I'm not going to say A.J. Green because, well, I, it just hurts. Um, I'm still <laughs> See, partially with him. I was going to say him. A.J. Green, so I'll no, just say it. A.J. I'm, Green's for me. <laughs> I'll say Anthony Miller. I'm, I'm divorcing Anthony Miller. Um, I've been saying that, you know, he's a talented guy and this and that, but apparently he's not doing something to get on the field and, and, and make the coaching staff appreciate him. So I'm divorcing him in 2021. Yeah, A.J. Green's the one for me because – Last year, I gave it a shot, and I think you and I kind of saw eye eye was, well, it's kind of a free square. See what yeah. you get. Maybe something happens with Joe Burrow. And then you saw all the targets. You went, oh, maybe it's going to be good. And then it wasn't, and it just looked done. And now I think there's that other thing where a guy goes to another team, and people get really excited. Oh, it's a fresh start. All this stuff. He's going to be, you know what? I'm out. I'm not doing it. Uh, Yates, did you find somebody that you're divorcing this year? Yeah, yeah. I'll go Josh Jacobs. Uh, I was a big fan of Jacobs coming out of college, and just – I this entire situation in las vegas i'm not a fan of it so i will have zero shares of josh jacobs this year all right on this day in 1990 <clears throat> dr penny jameson in new zealand became the first female archbishop uh, i guess here's the question for you will we see a female head coach in the nfl in our lifetime yates i hope so i, I think so that i think that if we can see you know i regardless of race of gender or whatever you want to find the most qualified person for the job so i hope that you know we can see someone rise through the ranks there and we've got female assistant coaches i mean obviously what bruce arians is, is doing in tampa is so much fun to watch uh with his coaching staff and what he's put together so i hope that we see that i hope that we see that happen one day it's a definite for me i think we're definitely going to see it and i think it's going to be sooner than people realize because we already have female coaches as you said yates working their way through the ranks what are your thoughts on this Ted? yeah no there are there's absolutely going to be one in our lifetime that's going to happen um you know you can make the case about nfl being a, a guy's game and this and that and it requires physicality that women can't do but when it comes to a mind there can absolutely be a, a woman head coach and she's probably going to be better than half the head coaches in the mm -hmm. nfl already so um so yes it, it should happen the most deserving person should get that job uh the nfl has been some somewhat and labeled in the industry as a cocoon um you know that they don't they don't want to let anybody in and they just want to keep you know breeding <laughs> you know their sons and bringing them in but mm -hmm. eventually they're going to realize that doesn't work and they have to go outside and say hey what we've done hasn't worked we right. need to think outside the box and some team will do it all right last one here on this day in 1613 which is ironically the same year that tag started wearing that hat in shakespeare's <laughs> globe theater in london burns down uh, during a performance of Henry VIII, and uh, Shakespeare, obviously known for comedies and tragedies. I'm going to ask you guys this, Tags, will the Texans 2021 season be a comedy or a tragedy? <laughs> okay. Uh, I think it's a comedy just because it's just so bad. I mean, if they had put together a good team and then like they, were just, they just didn't gel or something like that, that would be a tragedy. But this is a comedy, 100%. It's while updating the depth chart, I know Yates does the same thing where we each have our depth charts and I update it all the time and I look at it and I'm like, what the hell are you guys doing? Like, Gross. I don't, I have zero idea what the Texans are doing and um, that's, it's it's a comedy for sure. That's a good answer. That was a well thought out answer because I, I could see this going both ways there. Uh, Yates, how about you? Comedy or tragedy for the I'll, Texans 2021? I'll go tragedy. I'm not going to even want to watch <laughs> this, man. <laughs> Uh, there are certain things that you can just identify from, you know, far away. And you're just like, yep, no, I don't need to see that movie. I don't need to read that book, whatever this is. I don't want to watch the Houston Texans game in 2021. Oh my God. I feel like I even looked, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I don't know how many Thursday night standalone football games the Texans are going to have this year, but <laughs> probably zero, probably zero. I hope, but, um, I, that's going to be the worst because whenever you have a standalone game and it might be the Texans. You got to look at yourself in the mirror and go, do I really want to make this three hour commitment? And we're probably going to, I know we are, 
But that's going to be something to ask yourself. So there you go. A comedy, tragedy. You get it all. You get fact and fiction. We're full service here, Fantasy Pros, as always. And I want to remind everybody about our sponsors of today's show, uh, League Tycoon. Again, go to LeagueTycoon.com. Get started on that Dynasty League today. The contract salary cap leagues, they're all there for you. They're free. They're easy uh, to set up there. And, of course, Go to pristineauction.com and get five bucks on us with the code fantasy pros. Again, that's P R I S T I N E auction.com. Don't forget, we've got a lot of great content coming to you on our YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe to Fantasy Pros on the YouTube side of things. You can watch the podcast. Plus, we got a lot of other videos that are just coming out there. They're not pods, they're just videos. So be there. Plus, we got so much cool stuff coming up. We have draft season right around the corner. We got that Stefan Diggs jersey giveaway too over at fantasypros.com slash contest. Uh, and man, I'm excited. We were talking before the show. I can't believe it's almost July and it feels like we're starting to really heat up here. And that's, that's where we want to be. And you can hang out with us over on discord as well over at fantasypros.com slash chat. So that'll do it for us. But the story of the game goes on for tags and gates. I'm Joey P. We'll see you next time, kids. Thanks for tuning in to the fantasy pros YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our featured videos. And while you're at it, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Fantasy Pros, so you can get the latest news and updates to give you the edge you need in your fantasy league.